Welcome to Voices with Raveki. I'm joined once again with my friend and colleague, uh, J.P. Marceau. Uh, J.P. and I have had a series of very uh, engaging uh, and enriching uh, conversations. Uh, J.P., why don't you just reintroduce yourself a bit and then let's launch us into uh, the deal logos for today. Yeah, thank you, John, for having me again. Um, yeah, I have a, a background in philosophy because I was interested in uh, solving, let's say, my own sliver of the, the meaning crisis, how it appeared to me, and my philosophical studies allowed me to try and address this. I especially became uh, familiar with panpsychism as a way to address one of the aspects of the meaning crisis, sort of the, the idea that maybe I'm just matter or that my consciousness is somehow disconnected from my body. And you know, over the course of becoming aware of a uh, uh, Jordan Peterson's work, uh, Jonathan's work, your work, um, eventually was able to get in touch with you and have a, a dialogue more precisely about panpsychism. And something interesting happened in there where it turned out that, let's say the reasons why I was trying to use panpsychism to address my sliver of the meaning crisis, you were also able to address with your uh, non-reductive uh, physicalism. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And some of the, 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 the points some of the problems are really mirrored there. So in panpsychism, the, the, the problem of the one and the many shows up really clearly in panpsychism because you know, how is it that different consciousnesses can somehow combine? Because that's yeah, all yeah. claim in yeah. panpsychism. If consciousness goes all the, way, all the way down and that's the reason why we have consciousnesses, uh, then you need to explain how it is that those smaller consciousnesses, my, my cells or atoms and so on, how is it that they can combine exactly. into one? Yeah, yeah. And I was to use some Bergsonian uh, th uh, ideas to get, uh, get get clear with that, and Bergson was very influenced from Neoplatonism. So, on the other hand, when I was talking about with you, and it turned out that your with your non-reductive physicalism, you make use of Neoplatonic ideas to explain what's the, the same basic idea of the, the problem of the one and the many doesn't yep. show up in terms of consciousness itself, but still you have the, the problem of, of how is it that some abstract patterns, some unify the entities, some some formal structures can interact with their constituents in a way that allows them to be at the same time one and, and many. Mm -hmm. So we had sort of parallel sets of, uh, of concerns and throughout uh, the last year really, because it's been just a bit over a year, I think since we last spoke, I, I've been you know, more and more exploring this idea of emergence and emanation and to see how much I can get from a, a more standard naturalistic ontology without, without having to go full blown panpsychism uh, uh, yeah. already. Yeah. And, this led, us, this led us especially uh, to converge on the thought of uh, Neoplatonic Christian thinkers such as John Scott de Regina and also St. Maximus the Confessor. Yep. And really over the, the course of the, just the last few months, I've been rereading some uh, authors that uh, I had read more in depth a few years ago, such as St. Thomas uh, Aquinas, and was able to find this basic pattern of emergence and emanation in Aquinas uh, as well. And what I was interested to figure out today in our discussion was some of the, the reasons why this, this, this dialectical worldview between emergence and emanation was, was not clearer to me or to people in general, whereas I think you can find it in Aquinas or even to go further back. Um, Jonathan Pedro's brother, Matthew, wrote a book, The Language of Creation, a commentary on the symbolic, uh, on basically on Genesis. And he makes quite clear in this book, although it wasn't clear at the time when I read it two years ago, but when I reread it now, knowing what I know now about emergence and emanation, although Matthew uses different language, it's clear to me that you can see the same pattern between emergence and emanation uh, right, uh, right away from the start of Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens, the forms from which uh, structures emanate and created the earth, which is which was without form and void. So that's just the potential from which things will emerge. Yeah. So this was surprising for me to, to see wow. this uh, recently. And I was interested to see, so not only how is it that this dialectical worldview of emergence and nation was, became, let's say, unclear to us today. And I was thinking that it probably has to do with the dialectic across people or across thinkers as well, yeah. Yeah. where we have become it's not only that our worldview has become, let's say, flatter, where we have a harder time thinking of our different layers and track together, but the, one of the reasons why older traditions were able to have richer ontologies, such as you find in Aquinas or also in, in, the, the, uh, in Israel, was that they also had a much more di dialectical view of society in general or of people's roles. Yeah. So yeah. 
the best philosophers tended to be priests, people who were actually in contact with a lot of people. They were able to sort of abstract from the lives of all the parishioners. And they also had to mediate between them and higher levels uh, in, in the hierarchy. So they were living the metaphysics that they were trying to lay out in books. Yeah. And I think that our loss of this metaphysics is really paralleled by our loss of our, metaphys our uh, dialectical relationships in general. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think that's, wow, that's really beautiful, uh, JP. Uh, so there's a lot in there I'd like to respond to uh, if you give me a, a, a bit of time because yeah, yeah, sure. that was really rich. So <clears throat> I don't know if you know or not, but I'm working on an anthology called Inner and Outer Dialogues uh, with Christopher Master Pietro. We're editing it, contributing it to it. And what we've got is people from uh, Paul, uh, Paul Vanderkelly is contributing to it. Uh, we have people uh, from many spots of what as Sibylla King calls this corner of the internet. She was yeah. contributing too. All these people involved with these emerging practices and all this dialogue, um, and 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 what well and what Chris and I are exploring is um, the effort by many of these, like the circling communities, uh, the evolved community, right? Uh, all of these new dialogical communities, um, and even uh, other communities like Ray, Ray Kelly that incorporate a dialogical component to it. All these, all these practices, all these dialogical practices are an emergence. And so what we're, we're trying to do is um, figure out what is going on there. That's one thing. And then I'm, what really, what sparked my interest in this was a couple things. I had a discussion with Jordan Hall and he talked about the need for a meta psychotechnology uh, that curates and coordinates the ecology of practices. And I realized for the ancient world, that was dialectic. So I've engaged in a long project of trying to sort of reverse engineer what dialectic is as a practice. Um, and so there's lots of stuff, you know, lots of videos about that. And the book is coming out. Anyways, where that is leading me is uh, into a lot of the, the, the ideas that you just said. One is the idea that dialectic always had a horizontal and a vertical aspect to it. There was a hor horizontal aspect in which you and I, you and I are both engaged in projects of individuation and, particip and participation, right? Uh, because and every human being is, in, Tillich talked about that, and Jung has a similar kind of notion, that we're locked into this, this tonos, this creative tension uh, between individuation and participation. And then what we're doing in that, right, is that there is often between us an emergent logos. And, and like you and I, and this is, this is one of the, for me, one of this is one of the features of a dialogos. Uh, I prefer to use the Greek rather than the modern term. Um, uh, in, in, in contrast to normal debate or even conversation is that you and I together can get to a place we couldn't get to on our own. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's, so, it's exactly the, the, the terminology that you can, you can find. In, it's not the exact same terminology, but the same idea that you can find in other areas that are popping up right now. So let's say the, in the, the emergence notion in uh, modern philosophy of mind or cognitive science, yeah, when a, a new system has properties that you cannot reduce to the individual constituents, then you have a new emergent uh, system that is not reducible. Or exactly. if you, you take the, the older uh, notion of form from uh, Aristotle or, or Aquinas, well, a, a form, a, a, a substantial form in opposition to a mere accidental aggregate of things, a substantial form is a pattern that you cannot reduce to its four constituents. It right. has uh, attributes that are, it has new causal powers that you don't find at lower levels. Exactly, so uh, that's exactly right. So you've got this notion of emergence of new logos, right, new properties, new patterns, it's, and it's because it's an it has a formal cause, which I interpret dynamically to mean a system is self-organizing, as you said, not a mere aggregation or a heap, it's self-organizing, and especially it's self-organizing in some way that's self-perpetuating and self-preserving, and that's, right? And so the idea is there's that horizontal dimension, but that is always in connection with, it exemplifies and is informed by the vertical dimension. Because as you and I in, dia in dialectic, we're not just get getting an intimacy with each other. And I mean that, right, a a as a kind of intimacy of intellection and intelligibility. As we do that, we also get an intimacy with that very process of, intelligibility emerging 
And what that takes us into is the fact is that intelligibility is also something that, as you said, that is level, that is moving between emergence, right? And in the dialogue you and I will have, as you said, something emerged with the insight. But there's also a sense when you're engaged in the horizontal di dialogue, there's also a sense of emanation because you don't, you, you, you're not just arbitrarily saying things there, right? There's a sense of, right, that we're uncovering the structures of intelligibility, the very structures by which we can make sense of the world. And they're there ahead of us in some way. Yeah, there's like meaningful constraints above yeah. us that you know, tell us where we could take the conversation and we can sort of just select between them. That's right. So you start to, in the horizontal between the individuation and the participation, you also start to find yourself exemplifying the vertical move, right, between the emergence and the emanation. You start to engage in a process of anagoge. So as you and I reciprocally open horizontally, there's also a reciprocal opening vertically. And, and so dialectic becomes a profound act by which we simultaneously realize our humanity, because we're making each other more persons, right? Because we're realizing, actualizing our, our personhood, but, but, but we're also realizing, you know, what, 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 what undergirds all realness, those patterns of intelligibility, those layers of relationship between emergence and emanation. So, do you, and so I don't think it's a coincidence. I mentioned you this earlier before we just started filming. I don't think it's coincidence that you find, you know, Eregina writing in a dialogue fashion and Thomas Aquinas in the Summa writing in a dialogical fashion. I don't think that's a coincidence. I don't think it's just a mere sort of pleasantry or ornamentation. I think they're trying to exemplify in the form because they're aware of formal cause. Yeah. They're trying to exemplify in the form of the dialogue, right? The dialectic. They're not just talking about things. They're exemplifying. And, they're, and they, th what they're trying to do is make the pattern of the co-presentation of ideas a fine to be a fin like have an affinity to you know the very pattern by which reality is presencing between emanation and emergence and i think that's a profound realization when you do some of these practices right, like the, the practice the dialectic into the logos or sense uh guy sense uh, circling practice everybody gets this sense of this uh third factor that there's a between it, 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 and I don't mean this disrespectfully, you, you know, I don't mean that, you know, yeah. Jesus' notion where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am also. When you're doing these practices, everybody gets a sense of the we space. I've talked to you this before, that's somehow beyond. So the between also immediately makes people phenomenologically aware of the above and beyond. And so those two dimensions, I'm, I've talked about them abstractly, but when it happens, it's not an abstract experience. It's a palpable sense presence that is profoundly enriching and transformative to people. So this whole project of dialectic, uh, I think it, it's actually very, very central. And so I think to the degree to which we've lost the practice of dialectic, we have lost access to the horizontal and vertical dimensions. And then that, as you already argued, I thought very astutely, that truncates our metaphysics in a way that really hamstrings us and helps drive the meaning crisis. That's what I would argue. That's what I would propose to you. Yeah, and I, I think one aspect of it is when we, we, we talk about let's see, the vertical aspects of dialectic, the fact that Aquinas, for instance, was writing metaphysical books uh, where, as you rightly point out, the the Summa is written as a dialectic between its objections and responses. But you know, in his in his vocation, Aquinas was also a priest, yep. where his job was to be a mediator between yep. Yep. a cosmic dialectic. You know, he, he has to listen to people's confessions. He has to, yep. to yep. 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 He, he listens. You, you can see it as yeah, he gathers the potential of his parish and of his students. So people feed him sort of uh, refined information. And he has to bring it all up into himself and try to make it fit within uh, Christianity, within a, a Why story. Why Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Within, within something super abstract, something yeah. invisible, yeah. Within, yeah. Some, within heaven, you know, the, the realm yeah. of the invisible spiritual reality. And Aquinas has to 
mediate between all yeah. of those. Yeah. And I think that all of the, the mess that we see in, in philosophy starting, pro, start, starting probably with modernity is in large part due to the fact that people stopped doing this dialectic uh, with other people, also across yeah. people. Yeah. And so for instance, it's, it, this was really striking to me when I did, uh, when I was in grad school in, in philosophy and taking different seminars, let's say you take a seminar in analytic philosophy and a seminar in, in phenomenology, and you can clearly see that this isn't just a thing about, let's say some people think that phenomenology is better and some people think that analytic philosophy of mind is better. Like people had different personalities. Like you, you can tell yeah, yeah, that yeah. they were largely influenced by the way they interact with the world. And so this, the, the loss of yeah. a dialectic between people in the academia and the loss of dialectic between the people of the academia and the real people, like the people in the pew, this, this loss of dialectic that connected people and that allowed them to reach a higher dialectic is what has led to the huge fragmentation that we see today in, in philosophy departments or between departments in the university as well, where the, if you talk to someone in, in literature or someone in physics, they'll have wildly different qualities, whereas that wasn't the time if you went back to a time when people had more meta, uh, unified metaphysics or when the, uni the university was more uh, unified. And this really concerns me because I'm not sure how we can recover this sort of better centered metaphysics nowadays. I think that's right. I mean, I mean, th yeah, there's several problems there. One, one is a problem that I'm trying to address with a bunch of people, which is, can we bring back simultaneously the practice of dialectic and situate it, home it within a worldview that legitimates it and valorizes it? Um, but then there's, and I'll talk about that in more in a sec, but then I don't want to forget the other point you made, but there's also, you know, there's also a social institutional issue about how we've separated the monastery uh, right from the university. And that has led to what you, I think you're discussing here. But, so let's not lose that point, but let's come back to the first point. Um, so I think that point you made about human beings living, uh, especially people who had a, a mediating function, um, it's also very, very um, apropos. Because if you look to the father of dialectic, Socrates, um, he sees himself as always metaxu, always in, always mediating uh, between, right? Um, always between uh, the divine and, and the human, and he even sees eros as something that is uh, between the divine and the human. Uh, and, and so that the sense of uh, uh, of being something that inherently mediates between what emerges and what emanates is, is very, very pregnant uh, in Socrates. Uh, and then it gets carried through and developed uh, to, uh, you know, very extensively, as you know, in the Neoplatonic tradition. Yeah, so, yeah and uh, so even you know, within my tradition, within the Judeo-Christian tradition, yep. you, you, have, you have prophets or you, know, you, have, you have priests, you have people who mediate between uh, the people and God. They're never just like trying to bring the people to themselves. They're always trying to turn the people ultimately to God, to the higher story, even Christ, when he comes down, he says that he's always just trying to get people to the Father. Like, it's not about himself. It's not about just you know, him gathering people or him having something below him fit well. It's always about mediating between creation and the creator. Right, right. But also exemplifying. So he's, right, he's gathering people, the logos, into, like, there's the emergence of the, of the church, right? Very much. Yeah. But, but he's also... Uh, he's also exemplifying, right? Yeah. He's emanating, right? Uh, he's emanating. I, I, I don't. Again, I, I'm worried that I'm. Well, you and I know each other. You know that I don't. Yeah. Know yeah. To be insulting. He's. He's in some sense. He's emanating God, and that sounds like a heresy. But you know the language I'm trying. Well, to yeah. Is well, we can just say that he's emanating the Father. Yes. That, that's fine. Yeah. yeah. So what? 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 What I think happens though is that. Like, right. there's a historical issue. I think you get the shift, right, uh, from the dialogue to the to the treatise, and you get the shift to uh, non-transformational, purely propositional thinking, and you get figures like Occam and so forth, um, and you get nominalism, which at the same time removes the sense of there being these layers and these patterns 
And then you get the rise of that sort of monolithic, isolated individual mind removed. Like, so in the Ecclesia, you really have a, 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 a version, I, 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 I don't want to be too anachronistic here. You have something like an understanding of distributed cognition, that most yeah. of our cognition is done in an embodied fashion in which we are embedded with, with people in distributed cognition, that, we, that most, of our, most of our reasoning is and should be done in concert with other people. And that's what the cognitive science is now showing, that our cognition is distributed, is extended. Uh, the work of my friend Greg Enriquez and the work of uh, Mercier and Sperber, that reasoning, argumentation works better in, in, in concert with other people than on your own. So that monolithic, monological mind model, I think um, has been very, very disastrous. Uh, it actually has cut us off. And the cog side, I would argue, is now returning us um, to the view of the importance of the, the horizontal. And it's also simultaneously, and you, you, you've already alluded to this, starting to return us to right, the vertical because it's reminding us uh, that we are, well, at least the, the kind of cognitive science that I, I, I practice, this discussion of bottom-up processes of emergence and top-down processes of constraint are now rife through for e cognitive science in a profound way. And so the vertical and the horizontal dimensions are coming back into uh, prominence mm -hmm. at precisely the time, I think, when they're most culturally needed. Yeah. What that means, back now to the second point, I'm sorry, I'm talking so much today, but the second point about what the institution will look like, I don't know. What I see happening is I see these new emerging uh, ecologies of practices that I've gone to like conferences like uh, the Movement Summit, and I've been on panel and talking about, and again, no disrespect, but they seem to be trying to bridge between the separate functions of the university and the monastery. These communities are, are schooling people like the academy, but they're also demanding but, and affording self-transformation and self-transcendence and community building like the monastery. Like when you look at what Rafe is doing, it's, it's, it's like, it's, I, I said this to him, he, he's telling me about all of these things when I said, you know, Rafe, you're actually building a church. And he laughed and he sort of acknowledged that there was something going on there. And so I think that perhaps, I'm trying to be very cautious here, this emerging cognitive science understanding of the horizontal and vertical dimensions that are realized in Dialogos is coming more and more into contact with, maybe I'm a mediator. I just thought about that, that's a joke. But coming in contact with these emerging communities that are trying to create institutions or communities that are between or beyond the division of the school and the monastery. I'd say sometimes call themselves even secular monasteries or this school or that school. So I think yeah. that's what I see happening. Sorry, that was a lot, but I wanted to answer. You, you keep saying very pregnant things. Yeah, that, that's good. I, I'd like to try and bring something related. I have never sort of tried to think about the history of... Last time, in our last discussion, we talked about the idea of Christianity spreading through deaths and rebirths. Um, yeah. And I have never tried to think about it explicitly in terms of uh, dialectic. I've tried to think about it in related terms, and I think maybe it could help us in uh, this discussion right now. What, what seems to have happened is, uh, okay, so we talked about metaphysics going awry in the West. We talked also about how the surrounding institutions uh, went awry uh, also. Yeah. And I think I, 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 I've been playing with the idea that you can see this as a, within a, 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 an even broader historical dialectic maybe of, okay, so in, as I, I alluded to, you can see already in the Hebrew scriptures, this dialectical worldview going on between heaven and earth, between the yep. forms, the, the invisible and the, the, the matter, uh, the potential. Jacob's ladder. Yeah, you, you, can, you, you can already see this in, in the Old Testament fairly clearly, I think, especially in Matthew, Matthew's book. I think it, like, yep. it gives so many examples that it's quite overwhelming. Yep. Um, and then when Judaism will become Christianity later, it will spread both east and west. And what seems to have happened as it spread, especially in, in the East, or let's say in Hellenic culture, is it, it includes Rome at the time, you, you had a culture where at people were largely Platonists, especially uh, in the intelligentsia, where people were, or in general, the Hellenic philosophers were 
we used to see the world in terms of emanation, the, they, they didn't think so much about the, the matter. They didn't think that God created matter, uh, the potential. They thought that God, let's say the move mover or the form of forms or the one that from this, this form, from this, this set of constraints, from this, this source of constraints, we can even say, uh, shapes will come to uh, give order to the, the potential of matter. Yeah, so you, yeah. you have this top-down view of the world. Whereas what, uh, so, so when Christianity spreads in the, the East, in Hellenic culture, uh, the challenge will be to get people to see the bottom-up thing as well, because there's the idea that God created matter as well, and that there are genuine, there's genuine bottom-up emergence. So the challenge was to sort of get the, the, the Greeks and the Romans to, to care about the body, uh, at least the philosopher yeah. one. So the kind of heresies that you'll see is a uh, way uh, heresies where people sort of have this name for matter or uh, fit. you have origin who has weird theories about matter or about yeah. sometimes maybe the body being that so this it's sort of sorry, maybe you can sit as a as a solely top down source of heresies yeah yeah yep. and what happened in the west uh, is sort of the opposite you had like germanic tribes were fairly materialistic and i um there's, I think it's, um, his name escapes me right now. I read a book from a, an author, Brett Sarkold, which uh, Paul directly had on his channel, and yet good conversations. And he, he, yeah, he wrote a book on the history of transubstantiation. Uh, yes, yes. And he references, a, in the book, he references an author whose name escapes me. Uh, it's a Catholic theologian who makes the point that the Germanic cultures were fairly materialistic, not only, you can see it sometimes in Roman documents, like the Romans will uh, sort of mock the, the Germanic tribes because they, they venerate the visible things, like they're not able to, to abstract as much to the invisible. Yeah. And also, the, there's also the fact that because they were always warring with one another, tended to make them more pragmatic and to sort of make them really down to earth people. Right, so right. what happens as uh, Christianity spreads uh, in Europe and the European tribes become, uh, converted and have now they were fine with seeing the world bottom up seeing seeing like concrete things uh but they have to start to see that god created the heavens as well like that god is behind both heaven and earth that is beyond uh, emergence and emanation and now the, the source of heresies that you'll see is that they, they tend to see the world just bottom up so already in like the eighth or ninth century when uh, you not only have uh romans doing theology there but when especially like the, the Germanic tribes start doing their own philosophy and theology, you can start to see heresies where people will only see the bottom-up aspect of things and they sort of make more and more receding the, uh, the ah. emanation from heaven. Right, and right. so in the case of, uh, of, of the, the Eucharist, you start to see disputes about people saying that, well, either it means that the Eucharist is like, in, in, even in the accidents is flesh and flesh and blood, just like my flesh and blood, like the same flesh and blood that was on the cross, or you'll start to see people doing, well, then it means that it's just a symbol and right. symbol in sort of the, the, the pejorative sense that it's, yeah. it's just a symbol. So I think what has happened is, okay, so you had like within the Judeo-Christian culture, especially from like the early Hebrew heritage, you have a worldview where both emergence and the nation work really well in the, in the, in the East when, Judeo Christianity, it's Hellenic culture. Now the challenge is to see the bottom up thing as well. But when it moves west, the challenge is to see the top down as well. And oh, wow. I think that what has happened, especially you know, th throughout the years, throughout modernity, you know, the, the West, by seeing the world uh, bottom up and you know, making a bunch of theological errors, but because the uh, what you see maybe is that the church or the Judeo Christian worldview because it still improved upon what was already there, uh, it sort of gave power to the, 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 the bottom-up worldview of the Germanic tribes and led to science. And it's only just compounded because you were seeing real successes by seeing the world only bottom-up. But it's only recently started to, to fragment this worldview. We realize that if you only try to see things bottom-up, you hit like tons of problems that you see in, in philosophy of even just chemistry. It's not clear how you can explain the emergence really of chemical compounds that have properties that you don't seem to be able to reduce to their individual components or right, right. same thing that happens with life. It's a huge problem with consciousness. If, if you don't have it, like genuine emergence, if you don't have genuine forms that uh, will then emanate down to, to the matter, it, you can't really explain consciousness either. So overall, I say that in my more optimistic days, I see that it's, I don't try to just, so, some people, when they see that, okay, Christianity went wrong there or went wrong there, they try to sort of respond 
respond as a reactionary. Just then, yeah. then let's just roll back to the last thing that worked and the sort of let's stay there. You can yeah. see this in Protestants or even some uh, some like traditional Catholics or Orthodox. They just oh, if we just go back to the Church Fathers or if we just go back to Aquinas, then everything will be fine. But I more tend to think that like it's all part of one story where this see this worldview where emerges and mentioned what we're meeting well in the Judeo-Christian tradition. Like as it spreads east, it has a certain dialectic to go through until it reaches a more stable point. And same thing in, in the West, where you still have to go through like cycles of, of, of dialectic to get people to see the top down and the bottom up as well. You, do you and think so, that helps? Yeah, wait, I like this. I think this is a really brilliant idea, a, a new way of, uh, a new schema for interpreting uh, the history of Christianity. I think that's really cool. So let me make sure I get you that, uh, and you started good top down, but at the end you also alluded bottom up, which is well, well done, by the way. Uh, <laughs> so, but let, let me, so I might be presenting in reverse order the way you presented, but this is sure. a way of making you understand. Like both East and West have a dialectic between bottom down and top, uh, between bottom up and top down, right? Yep. Between emergence and emanation. Yep. But, the, but nevertheless, overall, the East tends to emphasize emanation and the West yeah. tends to emphasize emergence. And so there's also a higher order dialectic between the East and West. Going yeah. on. The and it's very fruitful right now. It's worth yeah. saying that right now the dialogues are really cool. Like the happening between the Catholics and the Orthodox or between the yeah. Protestants and the Catholics and the Orthodox. Like the, this, this split is, I don't know if it will really get, get fixed uh, in, in our lifetimes, but at least there's a, a very fruitful dialectic that wasn't going on a hundred years ago. Yes. But first of all, did I understand you correctly? Did I, did yeah. I, I got you? Yeah. Okay, so that is a very cool idea. Uh, that's almost a Hegelian idea. I mean, I have qualms with Hegel's understanding of the dialectic, um, uh, but, but nevertheless, that it's almost like um, the dialectic within the church, right, within history. Uh, there's also a dialectic within history, you're saying, uh, yep. that is exemplified in the history of the church, because um, it, it's exemplifying. Now that strikes me as plausible, at least prima facie, Precisely because I think that uh, processes of distributed cognition, which is what churches are, um, are going to be inherently dialectical in nature. And precisely because I think um, ultimately that has to do with something with the structure of reality itself as well. Yep. So I think that, yep. again, both the vertical between people and, sorry, the horizontal between people and the vertical between the, the sort of levels of your ontology uh, both cry out for um, a dialectical approach. So what you're suggesting is that even if people weren't consciously or deliberately practicing dialectic, nevertheless, their dialectical processing is still at work uh, within their history. Is that a fair thing to say? Yes, yes. I think we're embedded in all kinds of levels of dialectic that we're not, obviously not aware of completely. So that means another function of dialectic is by is through exemplification to actually explicate and make, bring into self-consciousness the fact that we instantiate and exemplify layers of dialectic. That's what, so there's an aspect of self-consciousness and coming to self-realization that would be an additional function of the practice of dialectic. So whereas what you've said is often people, this is happening implicitly and uh, unawares, but when people can, like, like Eregina or Aquinas, yeah. when they can explicitly take up dialectic, they can exemplify and bring into awareness, bring into self-consciousness those implicit patterns. Do I, do I, do yeah. I think well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you, you can see it as, you know, within this whole, let's see, cosmic historical dialectic that's appearing, there will be like pockets where this uh, dialectic is exemplified best and around which like more pockets of proper relationship between emergence and emanation will, will spread. Yes, so, yeah. so, so you can see sort of uh, Erogena and Aquinas as you know, pay, playing a part in the larger story and they, like, they can't fix it all, all the way by themselves. Like the, yeah. the whole process of the West having to go to the end of its bottom up uh, view of the world to realize that it doesn't work. Like Aquinas and Erogena were able to like contribute to pockets of, of harmony in that whole. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. that old schema, but it still, take, it still takes hundreds of years to unfold. I mean, it's, it's, it's a long process. But, but thank you for saying that, but I, I just, there's, a, yeah. there's something here that came out for me as, a, as an insight. 
this idea that I almost want to say like there's another dimension to dialectic. There's there's the horizontal between people. There's the vertical. There's the ontological. But there's the historical. We are embedded always in processes, dialectical processes. And one of the things we can do is bring them, and, and this does sound more like Hegel's notion of dialectic, we can bring them into um, self-awareness. We can realize them. And, the, and, and that's an additional function of dialectic. Thank you for this. I, I know that you're, I know that you're, you're fairly critical of narratives though. So yeah. like, especially, you know, I, I think this dialectical worldview of history, I can make sense of it within Christianity, but I would be curious, you know, what would be your reserves? Ah, uh, so, so, um, that's a very good point. There's, um, I can't, I can't remember his, name, his last name is John. He's on my discord server and he's been writing to me and he said, don't you think that dialectic is, is a kind of narrative, but he called it a non teleological narrative because he, he says it doesn't have, it doesn't have right. The, the typical structure. I mean, the typical structure you have, you know, you have the protagonist, right. And, and they have to overcome, right. The antagonist and, and there is the climax and the denouement and right and, and it, the problem is resolved so it's a finite game as cars would say and, and that's the structure and i've come increasingly realize that i because i've over identified that as narrative to core i think to, to be a little bit fair to myself precisely because i think the culture has over identified that with narrative to core uh, but i think what uh what's coming out in the discussion with Strawn is the idea that dialectic is kind of trans-narrative. Um, it's, it's, so James Carr, I'm gonna be talking to him. You know, our, our traditional no notions of narrative, right? Like the, the, the story, right, are finite. They, they're, the point is for them to come to an end, right? But the point of dialogos, because it's, the point, because it's about enacting emergence and emanation, it's an infinite game. The point is, it's not supposed to conclude. It's supposed to continually afford the re-realization of right relationship to yourself, to each other, and to the world, right? And so he was saying, but isn't it, in that sense, like if you could, if you could take sort of the finite structure of narrative, at least this was what I took him to say, and he seemed to agree when I, I gave it back to him. I hope I'm not imposing on him. But if you take the finite structure of narrative, and you were to unfold it into what Karst calls an infinite game, right? Where the point is not to uh, come to a conclusion, right? Uh, and, and it's not primarily oppositional where the protagonist is supposed to overcome the antagonist, but it's like what happens in Dialogos. Isn't that kind of trans-narrative in an important way? And I thought that was really interesting because my, one of my critiques of narrative is it seems to, at times, I gotta be really careful here, it seems to limit people to a, 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 a sort of a linguistic imagistic level of cognition. And for me, that it doesn't make enough space or home for the mystical dimension, for where people experience non-propositional, like states of transformation, but, yeah. I think, given what we were saying a bit earlier, you can see dialogos, if properly understood as trans-narrative, mediates between finite narrative and the mystical. That's something that I'm sort of playing around with as an idea right now. Yeah, yeah, I think that, that makes sense. And I just, you, you probably saw my eyes light up because it mapped onto something like a, a tension within, I shouldn't say tension, between like two, two poles of one phenomena within uh, the Christian worldview. It's, there's okay the idea that you can see the narrative that's laid out in Christianity as a let's say a, a, a sort of finite story with a, a start a middle and an end yeah. and that's it yeah. you can say okay so God creates the, created the world at that time and then you came at this time and then uh, you'll come back at that time so it's it's one one way to see it yeah. but you can also see that the events all of these events all of these events of creation like actually occur all the time like the way creation always unfolds at every instant is always following the structure. So God always uh, emanates forms from heaven. He always emanates uh, potential. Uh, all of these always meet to create the heaven and the earth and everything in between. It always comes back to God. We always mess it up with a fall. And then uh, there's always like some potential that will sprout back up to save us. 
and yeah. will be judged against that potential uh, and we come back to paradise that's one when, when christ let's say dies on the cross uh, he, he says to the the one to the good thief uh, today you'll be with me in paradise paradise is a direct you know coming back to to, to paradise to the garden in eden so like it looks back not to let's say finite point in history necessarily but it looks back also to uh, the, 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 let's say, the, the restart of the story, let's restarting yeah. the dialectic, you can say. And so you can see the, the narrative as both like occurring in time with a start and an end, and you can also see it occurring at every instant. And what occurs at every instant is the much more, let's say, mystical part, the, right. the part that, you know, demand that recovers uh, transformation that can actually apply to your life right now. It's a point that sometimes, um, People will, like priests will say in homilies, like if we read, let's say, parts of the of, of Revelation or the Apocalypse, or if, you, if you read parts of Christ's pronouncements about the end of the world, and if we think that it only like matters for, let's say, that day when the end time comes, then it means that like almost all Christians for almost all history will have read this for nothing, like, because it's, no it doesn't yeah, matter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> but we should like see this occurring at every instant. And so we should like always be in dialectic. We do, I mean, I do think that there is such a thing as, see, a, a global history of this pattern that will actually, it's, it's, I'm not sure what the end will be because it's described as a city or as a garden. So it's not like it will be a state where nothing changes, but I do think that it will unfold across time. I think it is unfolding across time, but I also think that at the same time, we can like mediate between this story that takes forever and our own lives right now and apply all of this spiritually. I would agree with that uh, uh, to, a lar to a large degree. Uh, precisely because one way you can think of mythos is precisely as something that's trans-narrative in the way I'm talking. Because you get a story in it, a myth, or even, a, or even more so, a parable, right? That looks like a finite story, but it's not, right? It actually sets you into uh, an infinite, an infinite uh, sort of trans-narrative dialectic. Um, and so uh, myths, in, in, I think, in that, when properly understood, uh, and, and, and I think they're, they're improperly misunderstood when people, and this is the, the, the sin of literal, literalism, where you, you, you bind it into a particular uh, time and place and location. Um, you make it a purely finite story, rather than seeing that the prodigal son, for example, the parable, is something that is going to occur, me, occur to me every day. And, and, and there is no conclusion to the, to the parable of the prodigal son. If you, like when people just allegorize it and come to a conclusion, I think that's almost blasphemous in some ways. I'm sorry, my language is getting very religious here. Um, but um, uh, because, I mean, at different points in my life, I have found that I identify and take the perspective of different players in that little drama. And what I've come to realize is that story doesn't conclude. It's always a perpetual time bomb that will go off and remind me that in my pursuit of justice, I have to remember compassion. And in my exemplification of compassion, I cannot destroy the structures of justice. And that there is, that, that there is a recognition of human finitude, but also human aspirations, right? And all of that, I have to keep remembering because I will, I will tend towards extremes and I will tend to gravitate to those sinkholes of local, you know, minim, yeah. local minima, right? But what the parable does, right? This little finite piece of text puts me in the infinite dialectic where I'm constantly moving between individuation and participation. Yeah. I'll use your language, between heaven and earth. And I never stop. I never stop. And that's what it is to grab, I think, to, not to grab, that's the wrong word, to grasp, to grasp a parable and to be grabbed by it. That's what I yeah. wanted to say. Yeah. That's what I would argue that myth, mythos and parable, right, are the language that sort of be... They're kind of the artistic twin to what you see in more propositional language within um, dialectic. But this comes out in the practice. When you're doing these practices with people, they move between their statements and all of the, all these metaphorical poetic gestures that they actually enact uh, over and over again. And they get a sense of these deeper patterns that are repeating throughout their lives, coming to the fore. Yeah, cool. I, I'd like to try to bring it back to us today uh, sure. in, in 2020, because if my, my best guess, you know, regarding this whole historical uh, dialectic, right now, we're, I, I do think we're seeing the end of, a let's say, a 
a strictly bottom-up worldview of just trying to see matter and how it, how it combines. And you know, this mirrors a, a breakdown in our view of, 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 let's say, social systems, where we have all kinds of social systems that are breaking down. Dialectic isn't working really within the university. It's not really working within individual in society, between groups in society and so on. We have, we have see sort of this, this widespread uh, collapse in our, our systems. But on the other end, you see the emergence of new systems. Like you mentioned, all of the, 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 the movement groups, summits yeah. and so on. Yeah. Like new emerging practices that promise to, on the one end, they emerge through dialectic, through people like interacting with yeah. one another and across communities. And from this emerges finer and finer uh, sets of practices and institutions yeah. and so on. Yeah. That will take the place of the fading ones. Uh, and you know, on the other end, I do think that even within Within Kushanti, you see this as well. We, we touched on it just a bit last time, and I did, I was a bit more mindful of it recently, but you do, there is definitely a shift going on within religious, especially within Kushanti, because that's the one I know most. I know that people are moving away from more sort of simplistic, uh, non-liturgical uh, kinds of practices. People are moving back, and see, even within the, the Protestant churches, they're moving to more liturgical practices. People moving uh, sometimes, right away to either Catholic or uh, Orthodox uh, denominations because you know they, they have richer worldviews, more dialectic across people, and more yeah. dialect just even like in the setting of a church where you do dialectic you know with your neighbors and also with your priests with yeah. your, your with this is richer the dialectic is richer in the older traditions within the Catholic Church there's like it, it's it may actually be a problem of like so many people want to move back that it's a uh, some, yeah, it, 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 may, it may cause problems. Like people want their masses back in Latin and so on. Uh, yeah, and yeah. like so the older churches are gathering more people. So you see like emerging with, even within the church, certain sets of, of, of practices, certain theologies being more uh, favored than others. So like by trying to, to tend to those favorable emerging positions, I, I do have, just because of my Christian commitments, and seeing this worldview as viable to me, I do have like a fair amount of hope in, in all of this, that this will be heading in a good direction. Doesn't mean that it will be good necessarily for us. Churches have gone extinct and so on, but like yeah. that overall, the course of this dialectic will go in a positive direction. And I'm fairly comfortable with just tending the garden where I, tending the, the, the places where the, emer the emergence, where I see the emergence of good uh, aspects of this pattern. I don't know exactly what it will look like in practice, but I, Let's say we, there, there's something really good occurring in this corner of the internet, I think. So I do my best to try to, to foster yeah, this one. I, agree. I yeah. agree with that. I think people are hungry for mythos. And given our discussion, this is, uh, this is enmeshed with a hunger uh, for, for dialogos and for practices like dialectic, which will help really realize dialogos. I think there's a hunger for both of those. Um, and it's profound. So yeah, I, it doesn't strike me as at all coincidental that there's these simultaneously these innovative new communities of ecclesia coming into existence and then more, more dynamically layered and dialectical and symbolically informed forms of Christianity, which you called older, which is completely right, I think, are also coming into prominence. Um, what, what needs to, what, we need caution on both ends. We need to avoid the conservatives' bias that the old is therefore better because it's old, and the radicals' bias that the new is better precisely because it's new. Uh, and, and both of those, I think, if left unreflected upon and unchecked, uh, could make this go awry in powerful mm -hmm. ways. Like you could see the, 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 like you said, you've already said, there's probably problems with people trying to go back. Like, do you need to bring things back in Latin, right? And, right, right. Uh, should we dress in Roman tunics? Like, right? how far back? And what? And what, what? What's going? And then, of course, there's the you know the innovation for the sake of innovation, which has become an intoxicant for our culture, is also yeah. a, a particular bias. Uh, so that's the two poles of dialectic. You know, either yeah, yeah. going all the way back to your position where you don't change, or going all the way back to the other position to which you're aspiring, and right. without like doing any. Uh, relationalization between the two to a yep. point that's yep. actually fruitful to both. Yeah, and I think and I would, I think, I don't know if I'll have time to talk about it today, but what's, what's, what's coming out as also a potential topic is the relationship between relevance realization and this function of mediation that you've been talking a lot about. 
uh, because, you know, uh, obviously dialectic enhances relevance realization in powerful ways. But as we've noted, both within the Christian context and in the Socratic Neoplatonic context, um, it also enhances mediation um, in, in important ways. And that's something I'm, I'm also trying to reflect on. Um, even the, even the self-naming as Philea Sophia, someone who's always in love with wisdom and never will come into right, a full possession of it. Um, that, that's, a, that's a statement of that we're inherently, the relevance realization is always a mediating one. Um, I, want, I, I would like at some point to explore, uh, explore that, that, that German idea with you a little bit more too. Yeah, sure. There's something going on there because um, Jonathan has made this argument to me and then Mary, Mary Cohen, somebody you and I both talked with, um, also powerfully made that argument about, you know, and I noted it at the time being important, so it, it stuck with me as a seed thought, you know, that this role of mediation, and then you independently, uh, but I think convergently with Mary's point, you know, the, that people, when people cease to experience themselves as intermediaries, right? Um, when that, and so, the, that the, the mono, it's not only that the monolithic mind was monological and self-enclosed, but it was also, and this follows from it, it was also in no way a mediating mind. Um, mm -hmm. And that's also deep, you, your point is that's also been deeply problematic. And that's Mary's point too. I think this is something that needs to be, it's juicy. I can feel it intuitively that it's a juicy point and it's, it's filled with epistemic and transformative juices that we need to try and uh, get back to at some point. Maybe the three of us should talk again at some point about that topic. Yeah, yeah, that'd be fun. I'm sure she'd be happy to. Do you know that uh, Jonathan and Paul and I are gonna have a joint uh, dialogue soon? Uh, yeah, that'll be great. Cause I think that, yeah, the event in September probably won't work in, in Tunnel no, Bay. It's been can yeah, it's been canceled, that, that event. Yeah, well, yeah. at least not, it's been canceled, but like in the sense of postponed to when it will be possible again. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, but uh, yeah, I was I was hoping maybe I could go, but I'll be very happy to just listen to the three of you as well. Well, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. That, well, that means me that brings a bit of sadness to me, because if we had had the conference, I would have got to meet you in person as well. There's so many people that I've never met in person. I'd very much like to. Hmm. Uh, did you, is there? I mean, we're we're getting close to an hour. Is there anything more? I mean, we we I think we we touched up a, a, a lot in a very rich fashion. Is there anything more you you want to address or bring out on this? Not really. Quickly, I do think you, you, what you just said about relevance realization coming into the mix is relevant to another thing that I'd like to talk about. You know, it doesn't have to be today because it's a big topic, but I, I think there's something there that could really help Christians such as me understand miracles in a way that's not like, too fraught with problems. When we, when we talked a bit, uh, just a, about a year ago about the advantages and disadvantages of our respective positions. And one of the worries coming from a uh, religious side is you have to find a way to, let's say, call, if you, if, you, if you can bring miracles in your ontology, you have to do it in a way that won't lead to you bullshitting yourselves. Yes. Uh, yes. And I do, it, it does look to me like whenever you look at something emerging, like there's always some aspect of, of, of a miracle there. And some people, you, you, you see people often within the religious side or even like the Pensacist side and so on, telling non-reductive physicalists that, well, your idea of emergence is just miraculous. It doesn't work. But <laughs> I, I, I like, I'd like to use it the other way around. You know, rather than saying that it means that non-reductive physicalism is like to be thrown out the window, I think if we can use the, uh, the ideas and the empirical research around emergence to better understand how somehow the, 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 an overarching pattern and overarching form can meet with, with potential, with matter, in a way that explains this miraculous emergence. I think it could help Christians you know, better deal with the problem aspect, problematic aspects of miracles. It, it, it looks like there's a continuity there. Like if you look at anytime like just a particle yeah. appears from the bottom layer of physics, it looks like a small miracle. Yes. If you look at the way, when I make a decision, if you were to look at what happens in my brain, like all of the coordination of all the different yeah. networks, it would also look like a, a miracle. And I think like at the highest scale, if you looked at, let's say the, the incarnation and all the different miracles that Jesus mm, performed, it, you know, it does look like a miracle when you look at it at our human level. But if you take, let's say the, the theologian uh, point of view, if you try to see what's the meaning of those, then it can become part of a pattern that 
that makes sense all of a sudden. And that also, you know, uh, let's say, gives you a criteria for determining which miracles are real and which aren't. That doesn't just, let's say, argue about the material aspect of it, but that more, it, that is more concerned about the overarching pattern in all of it. Like, does, does, the, does the pattern make sense in the same way that if I were to, to look at, let's say, my, my decision uh, occurring when such and such mirac miraculous occurrences happen within my brain, that I could sort of map, map the two. Uh, so, but it, it has to do directly with, let's say, the role of relevance realization between dialectic. How is it that different, you know, that the many in the potential can combine into something that yeah. under a certain pattern? So yeah. I, I would definitely hope that to, to have such a discussion at some point. Don't, I, I, don't, I would have more time today, but I don't know if you do as well. I don't have too much more time today, but we, I, I'm also very happy to meet with you again and talk about this. I'd like to set this aside because, uh, I, I mean, I set it aside for our next meeting, uh, yeah, yeah. Not, not, not dismiss it. What I mean is, uh, uh, let, let's make a commitment. I may, I'm making a commitment to, uh, let's have another discussion about this. I like what you said there because, um, so, sorry, again, between friends. I've never quite sure, understood sure. the commitment to miracles. I never understood why it was like, why is this so important? Why does it matter? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Like other, th uh, and what I mean in, in a non-question begging fashion, I understand if you're already committed to a particular thing and it has miracles within it, you there, you have a, you have a derived commitment to the miracles within it. But there seems to be an, an independent thing, which is no, you know, I, I have an independent commitment to this, which I never understood. But you, you just told it, held out something that was really, really provocative. Are you really cooking with gas today? The idea, <laughs> uh, the idea that there is emergence carries within it some sense of the creation. And I'll just point out that, you know, for Erogena, creation is precisely that which dialectically brings together emanation and yes. emergence. That's, that's, that's what creation is. It isn't just making. We, 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 we've forgotten that making is a model for creation. It is yeah. not the same thing as creation. So, and what I heard you saying is, and, and I heard of, I, I, Whitehead was in my head, but you know how Whitehead said, everything comes to, all things come into one thing that is a new thing. That, mm -hmm. right, that there's inherent creativity as Whitehead puts it, right? Yeah. That there, and I think this is like Persig's no, no, notion of quality too. What I heard you saying in, in all of these notions, there is the creation of novelty, and the proper way of thinking about that is to see it as therefore miraculous, where miraculous doesn't mean inconsistent or non-intelligible, because you mentioned deep continuity. Mm -hmm. But it's only intel it's always only intelligible after the fact. That's sort of a white headed idea. You can't see it. You can't from this yeah. side predict the novelty because then it wouldn't be novelty. But if it was just if if, if you couldn't reconnect it backwards, it would just be absolute chaos. Yeah. Right? Is this, am I, yeah, is this yeah, yeah, yeah. It's meant it's meant to bring us into something higher. Uh, so in the same way that when, when I do realization, when realization occurs and you can see all of different networks coalescing in a certain pattern in my brain, it's meant to bring all of those different neurons into an overarching pattern. Right. It's like a spark of the, the miracle, uh, miraculous novelty that brings the whole constituents forward. And yes. with, yeah. in, a, in a Father Michael Dodds, whom I referenced earlier, yeah. in his, his book, I really liked his book. It's titled um, Unlocking Divine Action. And he uses modern notions uh, within yeah. non-reductive physicalism to try and then make sense of how God can yeah, act through yeah, history. Yeah, and yeah. towards the end of the book, when he finally you know, has laid out all, all the machinery and he's able to leverage it to talk about miracles and providence and so on, he's able to say that, well, the goal of miracles is precisely this. It's that through different actions that God can perform in the world, he will bring us into his own life. It's all, to bring, it's all meant to bring creation into God himself, or you could say within like whatever the ground is of relevant foundation, the ground of emergence and emanation, like mir miracles matter because they, they, they're like pointers for us to get brought into uh, the divine life, to get brought into the very processes of relevant foundation. But if I understood you, you're emphasizing that there, even in everyday events, and this is where I heard Whitehead, the, the notion of creative events, even in everyday events, 
of, yep. you know, of oxygen and hydrogen coming together. This is the hackneyed example and water emerging and water is novel in some way to hydrogen and oxygen. You're seeing that, that, that yep. spark of novelty. That, so there's, there, there, there's a, you can say a deep continuity, right? Yeah, that's what I was just going to say. There's a deep continuity yeah. uh, between the miraculous and the natural in, yeah. in what you're proposing. It, do yeah. I, is that yeah, typically what, uh, what the, the language that is often used, and this is modeled up because I think different people use different definitions, but like typically people will talk about providence uh, for everything that is like below, Below, I don't want to say the supernatural. It's hard to explain. Like wh yeah. when, whenever God acts directly, whenever you can say the the, whenever heaven and earth meet directly, what you see will be miracles. Uh, so at the highest scale, when we would say in the incarnation, what what occurred there was miracles. But what occurs at lower levels, say the fact that uh, in our discussion today you know, we're able to to meet and we're able to uh, say meaningful things that neither of us had thought about yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, quite yeah. well. The, yeah. Within Christian, within in Christianese, this would be providence. It's it's like we have uh, an emergence of meaningful patterns that you couldn't have predicted otherwise. But we can say that the ground of relevance organization still participated in that. At, although at a more more common scale, you can say yeah. than what occurred at the incarnation. And it's even more common if you look at the uh, let's say subatomic level. It's right. still meeting of emergence and emission there. That's really cool because I I'm, I'm tired, I. I typically, and I, I don't mean to be insulting, I typically don't find the notion of miracles, you know, useful or helpful, my ontology. Yeah. But what you did there, proposing sort of a deep, it sounded to me like you proposed then a deep continuity between miracles, providence, and something like the ground of being, or the, you know. Let's uh, uh, say, you can say maybe nature, or. Okay, the, okay. Yeah. yeah. That's cool. That's very interesting. Wow, I, I would like to talk about this. Uh, because, because I, I would want to keep, I mean, yeah. yeah if, if you have pointers for what I could think about for the next discussion, you know, I'd be really happy to hear them and ponder them. Yeah, well, let me, I mean, the, the person that keeps coming to my mind right now is, um, is Whitehead. There's, I think it was a book written by, Ro, by Rose on an introduction to Whitehead. It's a really, it's a thin volume, but it's an excellent, um, really good uh, introduction. Whitehead. Um, and Whitehead is, of course, deeply influenced by Brooks Hall. Uh, but yeah. he's also doing um, what you've been doing and what we've been talking about. I mean, he proposes the notion of creative advance uh, as a way of um, trying to understand the metaphysics we're going to need in order to really deeply understand science. Um, he's deeply yeah. informed uh, by the advances both at the relativistic level and the quantum level. There's also um, um, Whitehead's book might be really good, Religion in the Making. Oh, um, cool. And also, um, I'm going to be talking with him. Um, oh, I can't remember. I think it's is it Matt. Or I think it's yeah, it's Matt Segal. Um, he's got some videos on. Um, there's the future, the future faces of spirit. I have a video there, and he talk and he talks about uh, sort of the, the Whiteheadian notion. In language, it's very consonant with uh, the work I do, but also very consonant with what we've been talking about, especially just now. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a, there's there's some yeah there's there's a lot of people that are trying to bring back this um, this I don't know I'm, I'm thinking of, of Weber here you know the just enchantment of the world they're trying to bring back an enchanted view that is nevertheless uh, very rationally and intellectually um, mm -hmm. responsible. So I think that's happening a lot right now. Cool. Yeah, I'll definitely check those out. Okay, well, that, that's great. So uh, let's make a commitment then uh, to talk. Maybe we can have a discussion of, on mediation and miracles and, and, <laughs> uh, and, uh, um, and, and try and unpack that a little bit more. Um, yeah, yeah, I look forward to it. So thank you so much, JP. And uh, I hope that you, uh, you stay well and everything keeps uh, going smoothly for you. Thanks, you too, John. Thanks.